So I'd like to thank Dr. Armas and Dr. Gandhi for allowing me to speak today. Uh, it's definitely a privilege. We'll be talking about heart failure and uh, really mechanical support in cardiac transplant, the ACHD population. It's a very vast topic, so hopefully we'll just cover a few things and uh, get some highlights. So our objectives today are to evaluate the current trends in cardiac transplant and MCS in the ACHD population, compare early versus long-term post-transplant outcomes, identify ACHD-specific challenges to cardiac transplant and MCS, and to recognize the potential benefits of that therapy. And Ms. Elias will be focusing on that part. So we all know that an increasing number of congenital heart disease patients are surviving to adulthood. And the burden of comorbidities such as heart failure has become more prevalent. And heart failure is now the leading cause of death among adults with congenital heart disease, accounting for even 26 to 42 percent of deaths in some studies. The pathophysiology of heart failure in the ACHD population is heterogeneous, as we just heard, and making application of traditional therapies is very challenging. So heart transplantation really remains the surgical procedure of choice for those who are eligible with severe advanced heart failure. So although the frequency of cardiac transplant in ACHD patients has increased over time, ACHD patients still account for only 3% of all adult heart transplant recipients. And despite the change in the adult heart transplant allocation policy in 2018 from a three-tier system to a six-tier system, ACHD patients will likely still be listed at a lower urgency status unless they are on some form of mechanical circulatory support. So how do ACHD patients do while waiting for cardiac transplant compared to their adult counterparts? So this particular study looked at the SRTR. They included patients greater than 18 years of age who were listed in the US for cardiac transplant between 1999 and 2014. And in looking at the characteristics of the ACHD patients listed for transplant compared to their adult counterparts, ACHD patients tended to be younger. The median age was in the 30s, compared to non-ACHD patients were in the 50s. The majority of them were also male and white. And most ACHD patients had undergone previous cardiac surgery, 87% compared with 39% for non-ACHD patients. But otherwise, they actually had fewer comorbidities. And only 5.8% of ACHD patients had a ventricular assist device at the time of listing, compared to 21% for non-ACHD patients. ACHD patients were also less likely to be initially listed at the higher priority status of 1A, where they were more likely to be initially listed at the lowest priority status of 2. So in looking at the waitlist outcomes of ACHD patients to non-ACHD patients by listing status, you can see that the purple bars reflect those who are transplanted. The gray and orange bars are the ones who either were delisted or died while waiting for transplant. Overall, transplantation was less frequent for ACHD patients compared to the non-ACHD patients, irrespective of their listing status. ACHD patients who were listed as status 1A were also more likely to die or become too sick to undergo transplant compared to their non-ACHD counterparts. And this suggests that they're probably listed too late in the disease process. When you look at the predictors of one-year death or delisting, a GFR less than 60, an albumin level less than 3.2, the need for mechanical ventilation, being in the ICU, or even being hospitalized but not in the ICU were all significant factors. So from this article, we learned that ACHD patients who are listed for transplant tend to be younger. They tend to have undergone previous surgeries. They are unfortunately listed at lower urgency statuses. They have longer wait list times, and they're less likely to have ventricular assist device support. But how do these patients do after cardiac transplant? In this article by Birchall, they looked at the ISHLT registry, and they identified ACHD patients undergoing cardiac transplant between 1985 and 2010, and they compared outcomes to their adult heart transplant counterparts. The figures show that the ACHD patients are in the blue, the non-ACHD patients are in orange. And the figure on top shows that ACHD heart transplant recipients had significantly lower one and five year survival compared with their controls. But interestingly, they had higher unconditional survival at 10 and 15 years. The figure on the bottom shows that ACHD heart transplant recipients who survived beyond the first year actually demonstrated better conditional survival through 15 years compared with controls. So what factors contributed to this trend? Well, the most common causes for death in all patients who received heart transplant in the first year were graft failure, infection, multi-organ failure, and rejection. 
And for ACHD heart transplant recipients, they were significantly more likely to die as a result of technical complications, but less likely to die of infection compared to their non-ACHD counterparts. Between one and five years post-transplant, graft failure was the most common cause of death for all adult heart transplant recipients, followed by coronary vascular disease, malignancy, and infection. And ACHD heart transplant recipients were less likely to die from malignancy. In looking at the causes of death after five years, malignancy and coronary vascular disease were the leading causes of death. There were no significant differences in the cause of death in ACHD heart transplant recipients versus controls. So overall, this study illustrated a very important concept, a survival paradox among ACHD heart transplant recipients. They do have a high early post-transplant mortality, and this is likely related to technical complications, probably related to their prior stenotomies, their complex anatomy. And though this article didn't look at how anatomy affected post-transplant mortality, another article by Lamorinal did show that Fontan patients did also have significantly uh, high early mortality after transplant. In terms of midterm and late mortality after transplant, graft failure was a leading cause. From our understanding of what happens in the pediatric population, risk factors for this include longer ischemic time and allosensitization. But patients who survive the early phase post-transplant actually have superior outcomes compared to their adult counterparts long-term. And this is likely due to the younger age of ACHD patients when they're listed for transplant and the lower incidence of pre-transplant comorbidities. So how else can we think about improving ACHD patients' outcomes? How can MCS improve the outcomes? Well, there's really limited data regarding this experience, mostly case series and uh, case reports. But most recently, Christina Vanderplum and Ari Cedars uh, published an article in Jack uh, in 2018. And in this, they looked at the Intermax database and they included all congenital heart disease patients who underwent mechanical circulatory support, durable mechanical circulatory support. There were 126 patients. The majority of them had systemic morphologic left ventricles. Some had morphologic right ventricles and a very few uh, patients had single ventricle physiology or Fontans likely. So in this article, they noticed that MCAs and ACHD patients really remain slow. They account for less than 1% of all Intermax population. And the experience with MCS and ACHD patients is really limited. Uh, 59 centers implanted these devices in 126 patients, but only greater than 70% of these centers only had transplanted one to two patients. The device strategy in ACHD patients is more likely to be bridged to transplant rather than dis destination therapy. And a higher proportion of ACHD patients required biventricular assist device or a total artificial heart compared with non-ACHD patients. And these patients also tended to have a higher Intermax profile. ACHD patients after mechanical circulatory support are likely to have early and late hepatic dysfunction, renal dysfunction, and respiratory failure. They're also more likely from their adult counterparts who underwent, underwent MCS to have late arrhythmias, late infection, and late hospital readmission. There's no difference in pump thrombosis, neurologic events, or readmission rates between ACHD and non-ACHD patients when you focused on those who underwent just a left ventricular cyst device in their systemic ventricle. So if you basically took away the patients who had a bivad or a total artificial heart, the, compare, the outcomes for patients who had mechanical circulatory support were very comparable to the non-ACHD adults. So overall, ACHD patients did have a higher mortality after MCS device implement, implantation than non-ACHD patients, but when you stratify by device, the outcomes were actually comparable if you focus on those who had an LVAD rather than those who had biventricular cyst device or total artificial hearts. So in this article overall, ACHD patients had higher rates of mortality and adverse events in non-ACHD patients, but really this was attributable to ACHD patients on BIVADs or total artificial hearts. And ACHD and non-ACHD patients had LVADs demonstrated similar survival regardless of their card cardiac anatomy. So really there is a potential benefit for increased use of mechanical circulatory support as a bridge to transplant in ACHD patients. So as we've kind of touched on throughout the talks today, the ACHD population really presents unique surgical and medical challenges that complicate cardiac transplant. They have a diverse physiology. They typically have, they have atypical presentations for heart failure. Given their previous surgeries and exposure to blood products and homograph material, they're more likely to be allosensitized. Uh, they're also more likely to require reconstructive surgery at the time of cardiac transplant, which can further limit the donor pool. Pulmonary hypertension and multi-organ involvement can also further increase the morbidity and mortality around cardiac transplant. 
There are also system-specific issues that pay, place these patients at a more disadvantaged state, the allocation algorithm, and also the limited expertise in ACHD, uh, both in centers as well in surgical expertise. So how do we optimize outcomes? Really, early recognition of heart failure in ACHD patients is paramount, early referral to an ACHD center, collaboration between all groups, including ACHD and heart transplant specialists, and carefully selecting patients who are really likely to benefit from the therapies. And we really have an opportunity now to recognize the patients who would benefit from mechanical circulatory support. And above all, you need a multidisciplinary dedicated ACHD care team. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually hand it over to my counterpart, Ms. Barb Elias. She is uh, our VAD coordinator and makes everything run. So she is going to be talking to you about VAD-specific therapies at our institution. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to come speak today. So when we talk about circulatory support, um, various forms, right? And there's um, indications for circulatory support. And these are indications that most programs follow when you look at um, implanting devices into patients. You'll notice there's a question mark by failing Fontan, and that no longer is a question mark because we know that we can place devices in patients with failing Fontans. When we talk about indications, there are also contraindications, relative and absolute. And these, I feel, are basic contraindications to any type of uh, pump support. I come from the adult side, and we follow the same uh, contraindication listing in pediatrics as we do in adults. Anybody that has any um, hypercoagulable history or any type of bleeding dyscrasia, we have to have them seen by transfusion medicine before we even think about putting a device in, in those types of patients. But again, if anybody has any of these contraindications, we really have to uh, hash through these in great detail before we make a decision if we're gonna do these devices. This is the current MCS uh, protocol strategy that we utilize here at Texas Children's when we place patients on devices. And you'll notice um, ECMO is included in here because that is a form of circulatory support, but for our uh, purposes today, we're just focusing on general VAD support. When we look at VAD support, we are looking in terms of, is it short-term or are we long-term? Is it a bridge to recovery? Is it a bridge to candidacy or is it bridge to transplant? And we're gonna delve a little bit deeper in this. Um, so this is a slide that shows all of the devices that we utilize here at Texas Children's Hospital. You'll notice there are six uh, devices there that have red blocks around them. Those can be used in pediatrics and or adults, but we utilize them in both. These two pumps here are used primarily only in pediatric uh, patients, and now we're going to take a little bit deeper dive. When I like talk about devices, I like to um, divide them in terms of short-term and long-term circulatory support. Short-term support of those patients with um, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, failure to come, wean off bypass. So we can put patients on forms of short-term support, right? One of those forms is the Impella or Axial Flow type device, which is a catheter-based rendition of support. This can be placed in the cath lab or in the operating room. If it's placed in the operating room, it's usually with a chimney graft so that it allows the patients to get up and be mobile. If, the, if it's placed in the cath lab, it's usually femorally, and these patients are uh, restricted to bed rest and can't get up and move around. Maquette Rotaflow is a centrifugal type pump, a little bit different, tubing based, more kind of like um, ECMO. This has complications inclusive of hemolysis, thrombosis, bleeding, most importantly, air entrapment and temperature maintenance. Uh, this is, utilizes a lot of our pediatrics, but we utilize it in adults as well. Now we're going to deep into uh, long-term support. I'm going to focus first on centrifugal pumps. Centrifugal pumps are those pumps that are third generation. They're uh, magnetically levitated and run kind of like a, a tornado type effect, meaning they spin, magnetically levitated, and they uh, pull everything in, blood, down into the center of its origin. And one of the devices that we utilize specifically here at Texas Children's is the Heartware Pump. It's bestly utilized in our pediatric and ACHD patients. We've been utilizing this device since 2011, and we have implanted 56 thus far, currently have one patient in the operating room today. Um, the Heartware is a very good, very efficient pump. It's good because you do not have to have a pump pocket for this device. It um, abuts the myocardium of the heart, this is placed intracardiac. As you see, there's a drive line that comes down from the pump, exits the right or the left side of the abdomen, connects to a controller, and then you have various power sources such as battery, wall, or car cable. 
The one thing that's nice or the nuance with this device is, is this monitor. The monitor has the capability to show us not only the parameters of flow, speed, and power, but it also gives us the ability to look at power and flow uh, waveform variability. And we utilize this a lot in our program because the waveform alone on the monitor tells us so much about the patient. It tells us about the level of support, their right heart, their bleeding, how well supported they are, and how much contractility that they have. Another long-term type of support is an axial flow type pump. So you're starting to see that there are um, axial and centrifugal short-term pumps, and there's axial and centrifugal uh, long-term pumps. So the axial flow long-term pump we're going to talk about is the HeartMate 2, and that's actually like the Archimedes screw. The HeartMate 2 was utilized here at Texas Children's from 2008-2014. Uh, Since 14 and on, we've been using solely the hardware device because it's a dischargeable device. It's a lot smaller and it's very easy to manage. This device too has a monitor just like all the other devices do, but this monitor only gives us flow, speed, power, and pulsatility index. No waveform that we can look at and base our clinical decisions on how to manage a patient. Another long-term device we offer here at our program is Syncardia, and that's utilized in, in the majority of programs. It's a pneumatic or air-driven pump that is um, a total artificial heart. You have a complete cardiectomy with this. <coughs> Are you familiar with Syncardia, total artificial hearts? Good. Um, and we've only implanted two here in this program. These patients have actually been discharged from the hospital. The limitations with this device are there are four mechanical valves within it, and whenever you're placing central lines, you have to be very careful that none of the tips of the line, the, the CVP or the PIC, encroaches upon the tilting valves on the inside of the device, because if they do, you will wedge the, the valve either open or shut, and that lends itself to a problem. This device is pneumatically or air-driven by an air compressor that is either the C2 regular driver, you can switch over to the portable driver, and then they go home on a Freedom driver. So this type of device does allow us the capability in order to discharge these patients home. Patients go home with backup equipment, of course. They go home with a backup driver. Um, the limitation with this is when you go home with this type of device, there is no hand pump to make it work. So if both drivers fail, the patient will die. There is no hand pump for this at all. This is just a picture that just shows the condition of the device in a patient and how it looks. So again, driveline cannulas come out the body, connect to the air compressor or driver. We have the capabilities to look at pressure changes on the device in terms of how it's filling and emptying, and this driver allows us to make a, um, changes to the pump settings. The Syncardia has a 50 and a 70 cc pump, which is nice. So if we have a smaller patient, the 50 cc can possibly fit if we can fit it within their chest, or we can utilize the 70 cc pump. New devices that we've taken on now, one is the HeartMate 3. You probably are all pretty familiar with that device. It's widely used in adult programs, and now we are able to offer that to our patients here at, at our program. It is made of titanium, much like the HeartMate and the HeartWare, but it's a fully magnetically levitated pump, maglev. Um, this pump gives full support, up to 10 liters of flow. The limitation with this is you have to have a little bit larger BSA of 1.2 because it, it is a quite sizable device. And this x-ray just shows you what the pump looks like on the inside of the patient. Again, this device too, as all others as we've alluded to before, has uh, peripherals, monitors, controllers, power sources, shower bags, VAD bags. The one thing that's nice with this device is we are able to utilize equipment from the HeartMate 2 on HeartMate 3 patients. And those items that we can utilize um, are in white. Those that are new are in yellow. And the one thing that's nice with this device is a modular driveline so that if patients damage their driveline and I have a slide with complications in devices, if they damage the driveline, we can replace a modular portion of the driveline. We can do it very easily. We don't have to have an engineer fly in. We don't have to admit the patient, nothing like that. You can just switch it out at home or in the clinic. And that's a very nice um, item with this device. One thing that's unique with us here at our program is that when you look at pump patient size mismatch and trying to get the pump, the right size pump to fit in the right size patient, we can utilize 3D imaging preoperatively in order to give us a virtual, um, not us, Dr. Dachi and our surgeons, <laughs> give them a better idea as far as if this device can fit. Some of some pump companies, actually only one pump company, the heart uh, that makes the HeartMate, um, Abbott, 
they have a plastic sizer that is re-sterilizable and you can actually fit that in the chest before you put the pump in to see how well the pump's gonna fit in the chest and originate in there. The other pump companies do not offer this. And so what we're able to do is do 3D imaging pre-implant just to make sure whatever device we're gonna use is gonna fit in that patient's chest. We have uh, a very unique pre-implant education evaluation program here. We teach these patients about the devices actually before the device goes in. Battery changes, all the nuances <laughs> with the device, the alarms, everything, so that when we go over teaching post-implant, they've already had exposure to this sort of equipment. Um, we have protocols in terms of evaluation, discharge management, bleeding, stroke. We have a brisk uh, community outreach program that we utilize with these patients in terms of going out to the community and teaching the referring cardiologists and local ERs, as well as a 24-hour uh, VAD hotline, which I happen to be holding right now, um, that is unique to our program and some other programs have as well. That allows patients, families, caregivers to contact us in the event that there's a, a problem, an emergency, or just a question or something they want to talk about at home. All our EMSs that treat in the local area where our VADs discharged to also have that number online so that if they're dispatched to a home, the patient pops up on their uh, um, dispatch, if you will. It shows who they are, that they're implanted with a device, which device, and what our emergency contact line is, and if they can or cannot have CPR, and if they have a defibrillator, and so on and so forth. One thing that um, our surgeons have uh, perfected here is the hardware placement technique, since we utilize hardware so much in our ACHD patients and all patients. Instead of doing a lateral approach, uh, Dr. Adachi now place it, places it um, infradiaphragmatically so that you have more ease of blood flow going down into the inflow cannula as opposed to lateral. So there's less turbulence, less thrombotic risks, and less hemolysis. Dr. Dachi has also perfected a driveline placement technique um, called rectus sparing approach, um, which has been very good for all of our patients. Um, because they're chronically ill, they have poorly developed abdominal muscles. Some are very obese. When we spare the rectus muscle, and instead of doing a deep tunneling all through the muscle, he just pulls up a loop of muscle and tunnels the drive line through. Um, reduces a lot of inflammation, pain, bleeding, um, infection postoperatively, and allows better seeding and ending growth into the drive line. Can patients recover on these devices? Yes, they can. This is just a slide showing how a patient um, with cardiomyopathy was able to recover through over time, over a year actually of time. We did some rigorous testing and we were able to actually explant the device and implant a titanium plug into the sewing ring from the hardware device. We at our program have learned the benefits of extended VAD support on these patients. Um, patients come in, they're so sick, we don't know them, we don't know them socially, we don't know their compliance. Um, some have had histories of um, cannabis use, smoking, drinking, these are adult patients, right? I come from the adult side, I know this. Um, and so we have to get to know them. Can we trust them? Can we do a transplant on them? Can we entrust them um, with such a precious gift of life? Can, can we trust them with these meds so we can offer device therapy? It gives them time to grow, get stronger for us to, in, to learn them, learn their family, and instill trust and make sure that they're gonna be good caregivers of this organ when and if they have to undergo a transplant. No device, though, is, is without its potential complications, right? And if you're on short-term, long-term support, you have all forms of complications. And these are very common in all of our patients, driveline infections, device malfunctions, driveline integrity, breaks in the driveline, thrombotic events, renal failure, destruction, lack of durability of the equipment on these patients. And so we have to do what we can to help these patients. And we've learned with all these devices that um, in terms of management, mechanically and supportively, these devices are all preload dependent and afterload um, sensitive. And it doesn't matter which device they are, we follow these same guidelines. We also have strict protocols in terms of laboratory assessment and patient management on these patients postoperatively as well as in clinic. We have a, a dedicated VAD clinic where we see all of our patients very rigorously. Uh, when we first discharge them, they have to be seen in clinic sometimes twice a week. 
but the majority are weekly for the first month post-discharge. Then they come back every two weeks for the second month and third month. And thereafter, lifetime is typically monthly. And then sometimes we space them every three months. It just depends on where they're living right now. We have specific VAD wound care um, protocols. We Some patients are bigger, some are smaller. We have to adjust the way we do our dressing changes for these patients because not one dressing fits each patient perfectly. We have the capability to monitor their devices. Well, this is actually a log file that we send off. Every time we see patients, we send log files off to the pump company, and this is only hardware that we can do this, and it produces us this, this beautiful report that shows us not only short-term, this is in 14 days, but we can look three months, six months, nine months back to see how the flow and power uh, trends have been working on this patient and help us help predict if they're getting in trouble in terms of a pump thrombosis or filling issues. Community outreach, we talked about that in an earlier slide. This is something very rigorous in our program. We do get out, we do get these patients back home. We do a lot of teaching in the communities. If they're 18, 19 and they've got to go back to school, they got to finish their senior year, they're going to go on to college, we do go and provide training to wherever they work or go to school along with the EMS treating them in their local area so that in the event of a 911 call, everybody knows how they can help us help this patient in the event of, of a call. This is just a slide that shows where our patients are geographically all throughout Texas. Um, nobody is actually out of the state of Texas right now. Um, and it, it's updated as of 4 of 2019. It says N of 16. That's total VATS. We have three HCHD, two ACHD patients now uh, uh, at home. But this, I just wanted to show you this so that you can see geographically where these patients are. These patients are going back home. They're getting, they're getting back home. They're living life. They're moving on and doing things that they need to do. I'm gonna go through a very quick case presentation. It's gonna take me just a few seconds here. And this is one that I really wanna highlight. So this patient is 19 years old, complicated anatomy, uh, dextrocardia, <coughs> CCTJ, large inlet VSD. He underwent epicardial pacemaker and lateral tunnel fontan when he was four years of age. He was followed outside and then transition care here. He was followed by us. He was admitted for um, uh, recurrent heart failure. He was failing, not doing well, and we had to make a decision. He was not a transplant candidate because of his BMI, obesity precluded transplant. He had BMI of 50. So Dr. McKenzie was able to take him to the operating room and he was able to put in a hardware device. This device was put in in 2015 and he is continuing ongoing. He did apply to nursing school. He did start. It was a little too much for him. He applied and completed barber school. He's a hairstylist now. He's working full time. He was also a soccer coach, but that became to be too much. Uh, he, become, he became recently engaged and married, and he and his wife are actually expecting their first child in August. And he had his VAT implanted on May 21st of 2015. But he, as other patients, have concerns, right? And it's the drive line. The drive line is a big issue. It's it's not very durable, and we have to do a lot of repairs on these lines. And we do what we need to do. You know, we repair the lines, we apply adhesive, do whatever we have to to repair them. This particular patient um, had line splicing twice, and the third splicing, we actually had to fix him in the operating room with the engineers here on site to repair a complete portion of the drive line. I just wanted to review a few key points on, on device support on these patients. Um, ACHD patients can and do uh, get supported on devices. These kids can go home. They can go and they can lead a new normal life. MCS um, treatment is entering a new era. There's a new paradigm shift with these devices and we're embracing them sooner and we're getting them in these patients so that they can go home and they can prosper and do better. However, with long-term support and doing better, we do know that there are device-related complications. They do occur and we have to deal with them when they come up. But most importantly, as Dr. Tanaganma alluded to, and we all know, you have to have a multidisciplinary approach in order to manage these patients. It's not one person, it's just not me, it's not Dr. Adachi, it's not Dr. Hari or Dr. Pratt. It's all of us together. It's everybody from PT, OT, all the way down the line. With the limited experience that exists in long-term support of these uh, patients, pediatric and ACHD patients on support, current outcomes are promising and we are seeing them in our own patients. Despite the positive outcomes, several 
significant risks are involved with these patients, including bleeding, infection, stroke, and mechanical durability. The key I feel with these patients coming from the adults and coming here and, and uh, being able to work with you all is the key, the key is patient selection and implanting time. You, we can't wait till it's too late. We really have to implant these patients as soon as we can, and it's a hard decision to make. But the sooner you implant them, the better off they are and the better they do. And we continue to focus greater emphasis on quality of life, quality outcomes, and commitment of resources. And just to close, these are just some uh, images of some future developments that are coming on down the line. Circulator Synergy is a pediatric device, but it's also in adults. The Heart Assist 5, Pediaflow, and then the Heartware Embed we hope is going to be very promising. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.